All right. Uh, hi, I'm Joe White again uh, with the People Progressing podcast. And today I got Kyler Brady on. Uh, he's got a great story for us all to learn from and uh, can inspire us all. So, Kyler, it's great having you on here. Um, I'm just going to ask you first, where did you grow up and, and what did you love about where you grew up? Hey, Joe, thanks. And, and I'm, I'm honored to be a part of this today. And um, so I grew up in Littleton, Colorado. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's home, right? I mean, it, it was the, you know, went to elementary school, middle school, all, all through there and um, really developed, you know, strong relationships through, through that process. And, um, you know, it kind of through, through growing up, what the, what the biggest thing was is I love sports. Sports is what drove my life. So, um, you know, everything's surrounded by playing hockey in the street or throwing the football around or, you know, doing something active. And in, in my, in my childhood, I think that's what's kind of, you know, molded me into my, you know, obsession with how sports is and, and what, it, what it evolves and how that changes and impacts people's lives. You're kind of exactly like me. I grew up in Littleton playing street hockey and sports in the backyard in the park. I mean, we, we kind of, I didn't realize that uh, we had so much in common there. But <laughs> went to, what high school did you go to? So I went to Columbine. Um, you know, in you know, in high school in general, you know, we had uh, we Columbine. I, I felt, and the reason why I chose, I actually in open enrolled. I should have went to Chatfield. Um, open enrolled to Columbine just due to uh, their sports programs, and and you know, I knew a lot of the kids going in, and um, just the that camaraderie and the and what I saw from a teamwork aspect that translated into you know, a, a lot of success, not just in, you know, on the ball fields, but later in life as well. And, you know, we, you know, with the, with the, um, the, the massacre that happened and all that stuff there, um, it, it was a, a huge family feel, you know, going through high school with, with, uh, with that. And I think, you know, for the bad stuff, the good comes sometimes. And, um, you know, it, I feel like it's, the call mine family is always going to be family no matter what. And you, you, um, at, when you were at Columbine, tell me you had Frank DeAngelis as your principal. You had Eddie Wojtek as your AD. Is that right? Was he there? Absolutely. Yep. Then you had Chuck Gilman as your baseball coach and Andy Lowry as your football coach. That's correct. Yep. That's yeah. So the Mount Rushmore of leadership right there. Yeah. I absolutely love every single one of those guys. They're amazing. Yeah, what a, what yeah. A good experience that had to be playing and being in the school with those with those type of leaders. It is, and yeah, each of each of them impacted my life a little different. I, I still stay in contact with uh, Mr. DeAngelis. Seems like on birthdays we we touch base and you know make sure everything is all good. Um, Ed Wojtek was a, was instrumental. Uh, you know Chuck Gilman was instrumental. Andy Lowry, you know he's still <laughs> figuring out ways to get the most out of his kids, and um, you know it was just his camaraderie and leadership, you know, was, was something that I've never seen before and, and people buy into his program and, you know, it's this wing T option and it doesn't matter who you are and you ruffle up your, your feathers and go, you know, and it's, it, it teaches you toughness and, you know, it, it's not all about talent at that time. And, and he has, he's got a niche for just getting every ounce out of a kid. It's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, they're all legends. Every one of those guys is legends. What what an unbelievable experience to have all of those guys in the same high school at the same time. That's that's crazy. Chuck and and Andy are legendary coaches, and 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 um, so is Eddie Wojtek. I mean, he was an unbelievable coach up in Gunnison before he became your athletic director. So was Frank DeAngelis. He's in the Colorado Dugout Hall of Fame. Right. Uh, as a baseball coach, he used to play against my dad. All those guys are just unbelievable, high character, quality guys. It's what a what a great experience for you. And then, what did you do a little bit after college? I know you you've had some different experiences. You had some adversity and stuff that you went through after college and so forth. But give us an an, an idea of what happened after high school. Yeah. So so after high school, one of the the biggest um, pieces throughout high school is. Um, you know, there was a, there come a time and we went, you know, 2008 was a little bit of a recession, right? So financially, um, you know, it, it was either you get a scholarship or you're going to have to, you know, either not go to school or you, uh, you know, join a trade or something. So that was one of the biggest things was, 
how am I going to get a scholarship, work my tail end off to make sure I can take care of myself, you know, and not put that burden on my parents and, and move forward. So I decided to, you know, accept a, a scholarship at uh, Galveston College, um, which is right on the Gulf Coast. And Galveston Island's a beautiful university, or not a university college, a beautiful college down there. And um, they gave me an opportunity that was that that, that no one else was at, that no one else was offering. And what that was was playing baseball year round. So your 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 four year universities didn't give me the opportunity. I didn't really have many sniffs from from Division One universities. So my goal was to be set out to get a scholarship, to pay for my school, and play Division One baseball. That that was my hundred percent goal. And, um, you know, I was clawing to, to do that. So at, through my freshman year at Galveston College, um, kind of – so we started out with 45 kids. Um, when we started on our roster, we had 24 kids to start the season. As you know, being a baseball coach, that's very slim pickings. So we went what I would call boot through boot camp. So we had a, a coach by the name of Javier Solis, and um, he – was known to pretty much you buy in or you get out and he's going to run only the strongest will survive so you know obviously i'm i'm under scholarship and my if i don't survive here i'm i don't know where i'm going to be right you know i i and so i had no choice so i had to make a decision on you know i buy in put myself through living hell to to go through this and you know he was a military background and did a lot of, um, you know, he, he's, he was crazy. I mean, we were, we were running a mile into the ocean um, doing beach workouts, and fish were biting us. We had, you know, our feet were bleeding. He wouldn't let us wear shoes. Um, and, the, you know, obviously, like, when you get pretty deep in the ocean, your, your head's still above the water. No, no, he's like, if your head goes above water, you're swimming to, the, to this buoy. And, um, and there was just no remorse. And, you know, I, I – built up some camaraderie with some, with some of the guys. And, you know, they, they talk about, you know, your old school Texas boys. Well, I was able to witness that firsthand and their qualities and values and leadership ability was, was unbelievable. And, you know, we all bonded together. And that, that group of those 24 guys was, was unprecedented. Yeah. And uh, something that was pretty interesting. So we had a, a, a pitching staff. And of the pitching staff, I want to say we had – 10 guys that were, 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 were pitcher only. And I think eight out of the 10 were varsity high school quarterbacks. So I, I, I thought that that was absolutely intriguing. And so when they go through the recruiting process, um, one of the things is, are you a multi-sport athlete? What do you do? And um, when we started this journey, you know, in junior college, our, you know, the, the, the guys that I would call were soft, were, they were the POs that were just POs all the way through high school. And so um, when, when, when we kind of fizzle out all the people who have the strength and, and the grit to get through it, we've been there before. You know, it's, this is like a football practice, right? Yeah. And so uh, we were able to, to, to get, kind of form a really good team. We, we got hit with a hurricane. Um, in the fall. So we kind of had some odds against us. So we got hurt, hit by Hurricane Ike. It wiped out our island. So we were actually out of school for a full month. I, uh, every, it was day by day. So we didn't know if we could return back. We didn't really know what, what was, you know, what we could do. And we were just wondering, well, man, is our school even going to be there? Is our baseball field going to be there? Um, you know, we have cars down there. What, you know, what's going on here? And so we got, a, we got back about a month you know, a month later and our fall season pretty much got canceled. We played, I think two fall games and usually you play about 20 to 30 in, in junior college and um, played only two fall games. And we get back, our field is wiped out. I think they found a dead body in our field. It, it's, it was a, it was an absolute war zone. And um, you know, we had to boil water for the first week we were back to make sure it was sanitary and clean. And our university was there, but Man, it was it was wiped out. So we we went through that, and then going through the spring season, um, we had no home field. So our home our field got absolutely demolished. Um, you know, fences are you, you can't even see them anymore. And um, so we were away every single game. And my coach just 
pretty much said, you know, this is this is our task at hand, and and let's get it done. Let's fight. And so we were small ball, ton of lefties. Um, you know, on on uh, from a hitting standpoint, we'd be button trying to make them make mistakes. And you know, we came came away, and we weren't the best team in the conference, but you know, we knocked off San Jack, we knocked off um, Blinn. We we went to the regional. We, we we did. We had some really great great times, and it was just pure pure determination and grit. But as I as I was um, about halfway through, is actually my first start um, throwing it um, at Galveston College. So um, I started getting a little a little jingles from some Division One schools, and they were actually coming to see me. So I was kind of our first guy out of the pen, right out of the shoots. We had some pretty good arms, and um, next thing you know, my coach is like, "Hey, we need a spot starter." You know, you're starting to get some looks. You have a real low ERA. You're doing a good job throwing strikes. And um, and first go, I'm about in the sixth inning cruising along and pop, my elbow goes. And, man, I was like, something ain't right here. So grab, you know, grab the ball and, you know, try to fire another pitch. It goes about 50, 50 feet in the, into the dirt. And, you know, I'm like, yeah, you know, something's not right. A catcher comes out. I didn't want to go out of the game. You know, I'm like, I'm fine. And they're like, no, you're done. Something's up. So I ended up um, not getting an MRI. Um, I, I stayed kind of in the rehab process. And I got to the point where I actually threw again. Um, so we had a regional coming up. And we actually, I think there were two guys that had some, some arm issues that weren't able to throw. We're down to like seven arms going into the regional. And... So we had a set of games right before the regional, and my coach is like, if you can do it, let's go. So I got a, um, I got a tennis elbow strap, and um, I strapped it to my arm and tried to throw through it. And wow. I was good. Like I was throwing bullpens all the way through. I felt really strong and good. My hook was really nice. I don't know what – something with the with my arm slot now, it was, it was different. And um, – but maximum velocity on that on that mound, bam! I, I it, it freaking sends a shock wave through you, and I'm like, holy cow! I'm, there's no way. So, came back home, and uh, and and got MRI. And uh, MRI obviously said you have a full tear in your UCL, and you, know, you got a year year recovery ahead of you. You know, we need to get you get surgery. And so, in the rehab process for surgery. Um, I was, uh, you know, doing well, starting to throw, you know, lifting, all that kind of stuff. Well, the the toughest part with this surgery is it just takes so long for you to get um, really a grasp on what this time frame is going to entail. And so I went through the process, and about six months into the process, I get a herniated disc in my back. <laughs> I can't, I can't. I can't tie my shoes. I feel like I'm 80 years old. Um, and it, it, it put a full setback on it. And um, so I'm, I'm sitting there trying to rehab, but my body deteriorated. So I lost probably 30 pounds because I couldn't lift. I couldn't really do anything and lost so much weight in all of the muscles surrounding everything just were gone. And, uh, and that's probably the reason why, you know, the, the back problem flared up. So now fast forward a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm set to, you know, I'm at the end of the year of my freshman year. Well, I'm set to go back to Galveston and Javier Solis leaves the program. So I'm sitting there. The new coach has no idea. You know, I, I'm not 100 percent. He's not going to sign me because he needs guys that are ready to go. I have to sit out another year. So went to Red Rocks Community College, got my associate's degree. So I'm ready to, you know, transfer out or whatever, and I'd like to go to Division One school. Well, um, you know, I, I had uh, a lot of conversation with Missouri State. They were kind of on the fence. They had a scholarship guy that was uh, that was going to um, go to the draft. So they had some money available, but it wasn't for sure, and that didn't end up working out. Uh, Nebraska Omaha was recruiting me early on out of high school, but things just didn't fizzle out. I wasn't ready, you know, for that, you know, the big division, big D1 school and stuff like that. So um, Nebraska Omaha said, if you got, um, you know, you need to prove yourself. I didn't know, I didn't know if you can throw. 
You know, I can't just sign someone right out of Tommy John because you threw, you know, in the first half of the season, you know, at junior college. And so I went to, uh, you know, a small junior college in McCook Community College in, in McCook, Nebraska. Um, you know, I was a, a big fish in a small pond, and it gave me the opportunity to, to give, to, to get that next step. And I signed with the University of Nebraska Omaha in the fall. So again, I get these, these offers and the scholarship and man, I'm, you know, I call my parents, I'm in tears and you know, all the hard work's paid off. I did it, you know? And so, um, you know, went to UNO and you know, it was, it was a great experience. I had a, had a fantastic time, met some of my best friends that I possibly can, but it turned into, um, you know, it was more of, the, the, that baseball love that I have of the game was almost turned into a job. Yeah. Um, in, and my, my coach was very minor league driven. So he, he, taught, he, he coached us like that. So you're on your own, man. You will lift on your own. We don't have team workouts. We don't do this. I can only see you 24 hours in a week. And I did, I, I didn't, it just, I didn't like it. You know, the, the team wasn't bonded. We didn't have a lot of, you know, we had, Guys living off campus, we had guys here, guys there, and and we had a you know they were almost clicky, and and it was just not the experience that that it could have been, and I think the NCAA may have you know their restrictions stuff don't allow you to do that, and if the coach isn't necessarily saying hey this is a, a group team workout I'm not going to be there but go ahead and do that, it was very difficult to build that camaraderie. Yeah. Now we had a very very good team. So in, um, you know, for, so at Nebraska Omaha is a little unique. So we were in the process of the transition from division two to division one. So we're in our last year of the transition. So we had a full division one schedule, but we could not participate in postseason play. So at the time we, you know, we're stacked. I mean, we have guys that are, you know, they're, they're low nineties and they're, they're throwing, they're, they're really good. And, you know, big hitters all the way around and we're in the summit league. So North Dakota state, South Dakota state. Um, and so we ended up being extremely successful and we won the summit league, but we were unable to advance into the postseason. So, um, from my knowledge, it actually is the first time that this has ever happened where a transition team actually won the conference outright and did not ex get to go and advance in the postseason play. So uh, we ended up getting rings and all that kind of stuff, which was, which was awesome. But we should have played in a regional against Oregon. And South Dakota State was able to take our spot, even though we beat them for the Summit League Championship. Wow. So, yeah, it was, it was quite, quite the ride. So Absolutely. Let me, let me ask you this, because when you're talking about that journey, uh, you know, my book is called The Three P's, Finding Your Purpose, Perspective, and Passion. And as I listen to your story, and I listen to the adversity that you had to go through during your story, what helped you or what made you keep going? Because probably, and I'm, you know, I'm not trying to be mean here or anything, but probably 90% of the people out there would have given up. You know, they would have said, okay, I'm just going to go back to Red Rocks and then maybe go up to CSU, get my degree, and I'm good. I don't need to keep fighting this. I don't need to keep, you know, from the time you went down to your first place, Galveston, and you were talking about being out in the ocean and doing those things and you're away from home for the first time and all those different things, that, that's hard. I mean, that, that's not an easy thing to do. There had to be something inside you that kept you going, that kept you you know what I'm saying? Kept you strong and kept you not quitting and, and keep, right. keep striving for something. What was that? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I guess it's hard for me to say, but it, it was a financial drive. It was something that in, in, in my mind, um, I never wanted to struggle. Um, I wanted to do what's best for my family. I, I knew the importance of what a degree means. And I also had, an extreme passion for the sport of baseball. Um, and when I put those two together, I have, in order for me to get to where I need to be from an educational standpoint, I had to truck through and make sure all that is taken care of to be able to get the prize at the end of the day, which is 
a that degree or that next step you know in in your career because you know baseball is going to stop at some point and you know when when I did get Tommy John um you know and I you know I was I, I witnessed some ex extremely very good talent and, and you take a step back and you're like you know you can only talent can only go so far you know I can be a great teammate I can do the things that that you can teach and coach but man I'm not going to be throwing 95 miles an hour with a with a 89 mile an hour slider you know it just isn't going to happen and I see these guys I'm like holy cow this is an impressive I can compete with these guys but man th this is next level stuff so that reality kind of came to play where um, my passion was I want to make sure that I am going to do what's best for myself and set myself up for the most success I possibly can and a part of that is to make sure that I maintained a scholarship and you know did well in class and, and performed on the ball field to be able to make sure that I maintain that all the way through um, you know my dad he's a um, an electrical contractor so one of the things he instilled in me he goes um, he made me do all of the dirty work when I was like in high school and and in, in middle school and he always told me he's like he's, he says he calls me boot that's my nickname he says boot um, I'm making you do this because I don't want you to do this when I when you get older he goes I want you to be be more successful and I took that to heart and, and really, I didn't want to do that. It wasn't fun for me. Um, and I learned stuff, but it, it, it isn't what I wanted to do the rest of my life. And I knew that if, if I turned that other path, that I couldn't, um, you know, I wouldn't be able to be where I am. And, and that's, that's the, kind of where that passion and, and perseverance came from. And, it, and perseverance is another P of mine, actually. But um, you, you, you answered the question, and you probably didn't even know you answered the question. Your purpose, you said your purpose was your family, right? You said something about, I, I wanted to get through for my family. I wanted to make, make sure I could make it through for my family. I always say that your purpose is greater than yourself. So you found a purpose that was greater than yourself, and it was your family. You wanted to make sure that your family knew that you could make it and do it and and later on, you knew that you were going to have a family too, and you wanted to make it for them, even though you didn't even know them at that time, right? You didn't know Talia, your wife, and you didn't yeah. know Brindley, your daughter, and, and all those things, but you knew that your purpose was greater than yourself, and you were going to set yourself up for success, not just for yourself, but for your family, because you said Absolutely. it was family. So that's your yeah. purpose, and you said your passion, your passion was baseball, yeah. and then your passion became something different because your perspective changed when you had the injury. Yeah. Right. So there's your purpose, your perspective and your passion. You just nailed it. And, yeah. and it's amazing. That's what propelled you through all that, that in your, your guts and your, your, your mental toughness, which I just absolutely love. Sure. Uh, going to go, go into this part of it. Now you're into your career. You're, you got married to my second daughter, Talia, <laughs> Talia Pelly, Pelly, who means more to me than anything in the world. And, uh, you got married to her. I was at the wedding. It was awesome. And then you have a, a really good job and everything else. So tell us a little bit about how your journey through college and athletics has helped you now as a worker at where you work at. And you can explain where you work at, what you do, and as a father and as, and as a husband. Absolutely. So right now I'm a, I'm a director of an, a private interventional radiology practice. Um, and uh, Athletics is probably the staple of, of, of where, and I would blame it on where I'm at today, um, is, is, is the big thing. So at a, at a very young age, I had a coach by the name of Ron Higgins. Um, many of, I'm sure a lot of your, um, your, your players that know him or have played with him or whatnot. So he instilled, so he's a little league coach, no children. And he, he, he didn't like kids. He didn't really want to do it, deal with it. He wanted to do his own thing. And, you know, he was never in a relationship. But he just loved coaching youth. And um, he, had, he, he just passed away the, over the past couple of years. But um, he, he took a group of, of individuals and instilled accountability, responsibility, um, and, learned, and taught us how to persevere through the worst of times. And – the, the, the biggest thing, and my parents will say this exact, exact thing, is there was a game 
and I forgot my jersey. And we were on in pregame, and I, I realized that I forgot my jersey. So I asked my mom to go back and get my jersey. Um, we, we weren't too far away from home. I was going to make it by game time, and I was fine. Well, Ron got wind that I, that I um, you know, left my jersey at home. And, you know, most coaches will say, ah, as long as you have it by game time, no, no big deal. Well, Ron said, you know, it's not, your, it's not your mom's responsibility. It is not your dad's responsibility to make sure you have your jersey. This is your responsibility. You know, I was like 10 years old at the time. And he goes, you have to hold, you have to hold yourself accountable for what, for, for what you're doing. And you're not going to play this game. You, you're you're going to sit. And, man, I was like, what, what do you mean I'm going to sit? He's like, you're not playing this game. You need to remember your jersey. And it is not your mom's responsibility to remember your jersey. This is your responsibility to remember the jersey. So I take that, that model and you, and, you, and you shift that into, the, into the, you know, your high school years and college years and into, the, into your, your professional career. And it's the, it's the same nuts and bolts. So you have to keep yourself accountable. You have to hold yourself to a high level of integrity. And in order for, for you to, to move into that professional piece, that's what builds a culture in an organization. That's what builds leadership in an organization, uh, maintains great employees, does the things that you have to do in an, or, in, in, a, in an organization to be able to go. So I've been kind of what, and I think I just get thrown into it. And, I, and you know, I, I think it just, it, it's God's plan is I, I take something that is, it's all jacked up and, and, and there's culture problems. There's all sorts of things coming on. And one of my tasks is fix it. You know, how are you going to fix this? And, and uh, you know, and it's more of you treat the, the janitor the same way you treat the CEO. You're going to gain the amount of respect. People have different skill sets. They have, you know, there, there's all sorts of different angles. And obviously I'm young. I'm in a leadership position. I'm very young. So I'm, I'm with peers that are a lot older than me in different generations and being able to interact and, 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 and give them the level of respect, whether it's a, you know, a Gen Z or it's a, um, you know, a baby boomer, we, you, you have to be able to balance that out. And that's where, again, the nuts and bolts is you got to just be a good person and you got to understand. And it's difficult sometimes, right? It's hard to, to, to swallow that. But at the end of the day, you know, everyone's a person. They all have families. They all, you know, and you, you have to make sure that you have that, that deal because it can get away from you so fast. Yeah, you got me fired up right now because it's, it's called empathy. Yeah. Right? I think empathy is the strongest word in the English language, and I think our world lacks tons of it. And putting yourself in someone else's shoes is, is a powerful thing, and that makes you a great leader. And um, you nailed it. I mean, that's what you, that's what we want in leadership. We want leaders that can go out and put people first, care about people, empathize with people. And if you can do that, I always used to say that I wanted people, I wanted my kids to come to my class. I wanted them to want to come to my class instead of feel like they have to come to my class. So it's the same in business, right? If, if the workers at your job or at your company want to be there, they want to come every day, you're going to win. You're going to grow. Your company's going to, your company's going to win. If you have workers that, that just don't really want to be there, they have to be there. It's going to be a struggle for you and your company. And the, the best way to do that is just exactly what you just said. You care about your people. You make them yeah. feel valued in, in those type of things. It's, it's, it's easy to say some, for some people it's hard to do. And it seems yeah. like you're nailing it. And uh, I want you to keep spreading that. Um, that word a little bit to, to people. Um, now you've also accomplished something recently. Why don't you tell us about that and in, in getting your MBA? Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously in a, in a level of my career, um, you start hitting a point where things get complex, things get very, um, very difficult. And, um, you know, being in charge of, of a, of a multimillion dollar uh, business, it's, it's a lot. And, so, you know, my, my boss, we, we, we sat down at the jarring table and said, you know, this, this stuff kind of gets, a, there's a lot here. You know, I, I would love to continue my education and try to figure this out. So, you know, kind of went on a journey to, you know, kind of look through, you know, is there a good school? Where am I going to go? I, you know, I have a, a newborn baby. How is this going to, going to interact? And, um, you know, they, they just ran into things that I was being challenged with that I didn't have the knowledge of. 
that I, I needed a little bit of an extra plug. And there was a difference of, you know, pro professionally and, and being able to say, okay, yeah, I know how to do this. This is great. But it also, on the other hand, there was a sense of security for my family, um, like you said in, in the past. The, the way that, that I, was, I was moving up the chain, but that sense of security and making sure that if, you know, I want to be able to make a lateral move if I have to. If, if something happens, you know, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm able to provide for my family. And, um, and me being able to say, okay, what, how can I get to that next level? Not, you know, just in the career wise, but making sure that I'm going to, I'm going to do what's best for my family. And so, um, you know, I, I went to Pittsburgh state university out of Kansas. It's a, um, they, they have a fantastic athletic program. I was actually unaware of until I got down there. Um, division two school, it sounds like, but they had, um, you know, kind of being in the Midwest, um, all of my credits transferred over. So, I was able to, to knock the, the program out in a one year, it was a one year path, um, 10 courses, um, two seven week cor uh, two courses every seven weeks. And so um, I, I gained a ton of knowledge, met some great people, um, you know, tough classes, easy classes all the way through. And, um, you know, that really, really just settled in and said, you know, I'm gonna just nose to the grindstone, get this thing done. And, um, and I told myself, if, if I don't do it now, um, you know, Brinley's, she, she's going to be two. She's going to be in those one, one year old thing. She, she can do a whole lot, but she can't, right? I don't want to be missing soccer practice. I don't want to be missing stuff like that because I got to study. So I said, you know what, let's just get it done. If we don't do it now, it's not going to happen. So plug through it and, um, you know, got through it. And I graduated, I, I hypothetically graduated in July. So I received my MBA in July and then walked across the stage um, just a couple weeks ago. So. What a great accomplishment. And, you know, the thing that makes you a great leader, too, is you're selfless. I mean, you, you're always thinking of someone else. And, again, that's the purpose aspect of what I'm talking about here. You keep mentioning it all the time. Everything you do is because you have a purpose that's greater than yourself. You, you went to get your MBA because you wanted to be able to provide for your family. You went and got your MBA now because you want to be able to spend more time with your family you know, and, and all those things. And that, that's what makes you a special leader and a special person. And it's, it's really cool to listen to your story. You, you've had to persevere just over and over and over from, from all the way up, all the way from your high school days through college, especially through college with what you went through and everything else. Yeah. What's one of the things that you found um, being a leader in, in your company, what's one of the hardest things that you, that, you didn't, weren't really expecting or it's just kind of hard to deal with sometimes? Yeah. So, I mean, um, I'm in healthcare, so there's, there's multiple challenges, right? I could, we could talk, you know, everything under the sun from COVID to, to all, all sorts of things, but really the, the biggest challenges are the, the people who don't buy in. So when you don't get that buy-in, how do you form, you know, how do you form productivity? How do you form, all this, um, you know, positivity per se. So um, being able to really engage and, 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 and spend more time, and that's really the biggest thing is, is being able to, to relate to the person and say, you know, this is, this is not just a job. This is, you know, we, we need you to be engaged. We need you to be able to, to do this. And the way I pose this, and I do this in, in, the, interview, in the interview process when I bring on new talent is, um, these jobs are, are educational, um, especially in healthcare. And, and one of the things that, that I, I preach to, to our people is if you're just going to be here going through the motions and getting the jobs, this isn't the right role for you. Um, if you want to absorb and learn every facet of this thing, that's the people who are going to succeed here. Um, that's, and I tell them, I go, I'm sitting in this chair today because I tried to absorb as many things as possible and, and tried to listen to and dive into everything I possibly could. And that well-roundedness got me in, into the role that I am. So we have, um, like for example, our, um, our medical assistant is planning to go to medical school. So, um, you know, she's, we know we're gonna lose her, which that's completely fine. But the, the reason why, you know, she just got out of, out of college and, you know, she's very inexperienced, but I don't care. I, you know, she's, she's coachable, she's teachable. And uh, it really makes a big impact on the individual to say, 
I'm going to learn and absorb as much as humanly possible because it's going to help me in my career. And those are the people that are really going to engage and, and take that next step. And when you don't have those people, that is an extreme challenge. And sometimes you can get wooed over in an interview and they just don't have it. And that's, those are the people that, that I struggle with. And, and I, I try to engage and give them as much time, but some people just don't have it in them. Yeah. And that's, that's a tough thing. And you're, what's impressive about you, Kyler, is, you, is how old are you? 20? I'm 30. 30? Yeah. To, to be so young and, and to be in such a high leadership position is, gives me hope <laughs> in terms of leadership coming up. Um, sure. I, I, I really believe we're in a leadership, you know, I, I told you before we started that 70% of Americans are disengaged at work. And I, I think we have a leadership shortage in our country. Um, and you're, you're giving me some hope here that you, you're a people first leader. And the name of this is called people progressing. And, and you, you keep saying it over and over. Your, your purpose is always others because you want your people that you are leading to learn and grow every day. Right. That's what you just said. You, you know, yeah. and I think the greatest leaders lead their people to learn, to learn and grow and progress every day. So when they come to work at your business at eight o'clock in the morning, let's say, and they leave at five, when they leave at five, they, they have grown from eight to five. They're, they, they're, they're stronger. They know more, they've learned more and they're, they're better. They're growing all the time. And you just said that that's what you love to do with your people. And it's because you have a heart that is progressing, that, that wants people to progress. You want people to grow. You want people to do that. Now, the, if I can give you any advice, I call it PIP. Pray, inspire, and, and progress. So every morning on your way to work, I want you to pray for three things that you're thankful for. I want you to listen to something that will inspire you. Okay, whether it's a song, whether it's um, a podcast or something. And as you're listening to that, I want that to inspire you, to get you inspired to inspire others, which I know you do on a daily basis. And then the last one is thinking how you can progress for the day and gr learn and grow and how you can help your people progress and learn and grow. So I don't know how long it is for you to go to work, but it's called PIP. I call it PIP. Right. Pray, inspire, and progress. And um, you know what you do every day? You do that. Yeah. You do that. And that's, that's what's so unbelievable about a 30-year-old leader of a company. And, and I just love it. I, it. You got me also, you got me fired up. Sure. Um, is there anything else that you can say, you know, um, as, you, as we kind of finish this up here, in terms of advice for somebody, a young person getting out of college and getting into work and wanting to become and progress like you've progressed um, early. Is there any kind of advice you would give them? Yeah. I mean, utilize your resources, utilize people that have been there, done that before, absorb as much as possible, take it as educational experiences. Um, you know, everything is attainable. You know, I, I, did, I never in a million years thought that I would be receiving my MBA. Um, you know, I, I had people that, didn't even think I was going to graduate college, right? And um, or, or, or get my bachelor's degree. And so, it's you can figure out ways to get it done that won't bury you in debt, that won't um, you know take away time and, and and get things taken care of to to further you. And that's that's the biggest thing. And just being a part of someone and being a part of a team. And um, you know, as I coin myself as as the reason why I I. I, I get the engagement of employees and I get the, um, the pieces. Um, I'm not going to just watch them burn in a fire. I'm going to jump in the fire with them. And, um, and that's where, and sometimes it's, it's detrimental, right? I'm spending too much time in the fire, right? And as, as businesses grow, you don't want to do that sometimes, but um, the level of respect that you gain that you'll take a, a, a patient phone call when the patient's you know, you're calling um, that I'm not above them and I, I, I'm right there with them and we're on the same team. And um, when COVID hits and you're having to work from home when you usually don't and because you got kids and, and, and we, we team up and say, 
you need to take care of your family. We're going to get this thing taken care of. You don't worry about us. We'll take care of it. Everything will be fine. And, um, and those type of, those type of leaders are, are, um, they're hard to find nowadays. And, and, and thankfully, you know, um, you know, our, our owner of our practice, you know, understands that as well. And, and that integrity and, and, and loyalty to that is, is, is supported. So I can then become the leader that I want to be, which is the same deal. Um, you know, take care of other people's business if we need to, um, because there's times where Brindley's daycare got shut down, right? And, and, and I need some help. And, and, and there are things that are uncontrollable. And as long as things aren't getting, you know, people aren't taking advantage of them, which if you have that kind of culture, they don't do it, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's the great thing about um, buying and, and, and making that difference in someone's, in someone's life that they, they know that we got your back. Yeah. You're always, you're always thinking of someone else first. You're selfless uh, I did, and you have a ton of empathy. Um, I, I just love it. And, and I think you've nailed it on the head too. When you talk about building culture and teamwork, I think culture and teamwork are, are it. I, I, I just think if you don't have those two things in your business or on your team or whatever it is, you, you ain't going to win. Yeah. And, you know, and that, it, it's an amazing, uh, this has been cool. This has been so fun to listen to a young, um, leader out in the world, leader out in our community, leader out in the, you know, um, in your company and, and so forth. And, you know, I wish you nothing but the best here. And if there's anything I can ever do for you, just let me know. But I, I think I want to come work for you. <laughs> you take an old guy like me to, it, and come work for you. Cause you're we the, can find a spot for you. <laughs> you're, you're the leader I would want to work for. So I, right. I appreciate you being on here. Um, this is cool. This is going to inspire a lot of people. It's going to give a lot of people hope that they can make it through tough times, just like you had to make it through tough times and they can do it. Yep. And, uh, you know, going through an arm injury, going, you know, that first year of college when you're out in the ocean and you're sitting in the ocean and, and, and then you have the arm injury and then you, you know, you, you can't get to the college you wanted to right away. So you had to go to another college first and then get to the college you want to go to, you know, just it's perseverance. And it's, I have a saying that says character wins and you have the highest of character and you, you're going to win all the time because your character is huge and you're building character in other people. And I think that's just phenomenal. You're phenomenal. So I appreciate you being on here and uh, we'll get this up and, and, and start inspiring more and more people with what you had to say. Sure. No, I appreciate it, Joe. And uh, yeah, thank you. It's an honor to be on this, on this piece. I, this stuff gets me going. So oh, it's... I, 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 I like talking about it and um, you know, but I do love to share my story. I do think it's, it's a little unique um, and, and that's it's special. It's yeah. special. Yeah. So thanks for being on and, and uh, we'll, we'll hook up soon. We'll talk soon.